memory verse. So, hopefully you took your Prevagen. Let's give it a whirl. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Need it up your dosage. All right. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Continuing with his Maundy Thursday discourse, which has covered things such as humility and service to others, the new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. Jesus makes a promise that he's going to prepare a place for us in his Father's house. He describes the close relationship between God the Father and himself, God the Son, telling the disciples to believe me, that I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me, and whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father, finally promising that if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Which takes us to our text for today. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now the first thought that might go through your mind at the sound of these words are, oh no, I've got to do something. I mean, honestly, the statement looks and it sounds like a conditional statement, a sort of, if you do this, then I'll do that. It feels as if there's a condition to be met. And indeed, if this statement was stated as an imperative or as a command, one might correctly deduce that we're being called upon to do something. If I love Jesus, then I must obey his commandments is what it would sound like. However, that is not what Jesus says, is it? I mean, listen closely. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Rather than being stated as a command, if you love me, then you must keep my commandments. Jesus uses a future participle. You will keep my commandments. See, this isn't religion. This isn't getting smacked upside the head with rules and regulations. This is a relationship that's being described, one that produces a response. It's as if Jesus were saying to us, because you love me, you're going to keep my commandments because of this special bond we have. In his letters to the early church written toward the end of the century, the Apostle John will write to a whole new generation of believers. And he's going to tell them this. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. We love because God first loved us. God loves us and in response we love him. God extends his love to all of us even as Jesus spreads wide his arms upon the cross to embrace the sins of the world. What Jesus does in his sacrificial love, he does for all of us. And as God has loved us, therefore, we are called upon to love one another, even as Jesus commanded. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another, and by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So here, the relationship is clearly established. God loves you, and you are led by faith to love him. And because God so loved the world, he gave his only son, we as his beloved ones are now to love in the manner by which we have been loved. We are loved to be loving. Now, is any of this stuff easy? Well, no, it's not. I mean, if it were, 
We could have been loving God and loving others all along, which is ultimately what God's commandments are all about. Remember Matthew 22. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Simply put, love God, love others, repeat. It's that simple, but it's not easy. Now, loving God is not difficult when you look at the cross. I mean, you see Jesus hanging there, nailed to the wood. Well, that's how God says, I love you this much. As Peter tells us in today's epistle, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So what's not to love? The perfect one covers our imperfections by the shedding of his holy blood. The Son of God lowers himself from his majesty into our mortality in order to lift us up unto immortality. Sinless, without spot or stain, the priest offers himself as the sacrifice for us so that our debt to sin would be paid in full. Loving God who so loved us that he sent his very son to make satisfaction for our sins. Yeah, that's the easy part if there's such a thing. The real difficulty is loving one another. I mean, loving sinners isn't for the faint of heart. All you need to do is watch the news at night, observing how unloving men can be to their fellow man and how unlovable we must appear before God. We don't necessarily like each other, and that's even in our families. We argue and we bicker, we cheat one another. We're always looking to take advantage of any situation that could favor us or help us to overcome. Dysfunctional relationships destroy families, as well as other relationships, even, and I would say especially in churches. If strangers are going to love strangers and neighbors are going to be more neighborly, then we need more than simple good thoughts and well wishes, right? And I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will give to you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. It is God's divine agape love which enables him to see past our sinful self by giving us Jesus, who brings to us forgiveness of sins and newness of life. The Spirit ever points us to God in his love. He dwells in the word and the sacraments. He lives in our hearts by his gift of faith. And it's because of the Holy Spirit that we hear and believe. It is the Spirit who moves us to confess and to be saved. God the Father created us by his very hand, breathing life with his breath into the nostrils of lifeless clay. It is God the Son who comes to redeem sinners from their sins by his sacrifice, by pouring out his blood to cover those sins. And it is God the Holy Spirit who speaks to us in God's word, who empowers us by his means of grace, to love God and our fellow man. So how do we obey Christ's commandments? By loving him who first loved us. In Jesus alone, the Spirit enables us to love God, love others, and repeat. Dorothy Schultz wrote a hymn along with her husband, Ralph, who wrote the tune. It pictures what it means to love and obey. We find it in the Lutheran service book, number 706. Love in Christ is strong and living, binding faithful hearts in one. Love in Christ is true and giving. May his will in us be done. Love is patient and forbearing, clothed in Christ's humility. Gentle, selfless, kind and caring, reaching out in charity. Love in Christ abides forever, fainting not when ills attend. Love forgiving and forgiven shall endure until life's 
end. Now Jesus closes our gospel reading with a promise. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That in a little while the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. And whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. And we all know in our hearts and minds that a promise made by Jesus is a promise kept. Loved by God in Jesus Christ, we can love by the working of the Spirit of Christ. In that love, may we commit to obeying Jesus in much the same manner as the psalmist writes about his relationship with God, saying, I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. In Jesus Christ, God's name will be praised as we love and obey. And all God's people said, Amen.